we are studying Parshat Vayishlach, and he sent. Ready to rock? Here we go. What I want to say first is we have our standard overview regarding chapters 32 through 36. Now, 36 is the toldot of Isav, the generations of Esau. It's, it's a, the whole chapter is basically all the descendants of Esau. Uh, and we'll not cover that for obvious reasons, but there is some fascinating stuff there nevertheless. Um, in Genesis 32, we have Jacob returning to the promised land after having been with Uncle Laban for what, somewhere between 20 and some people extend that out, but it, by all accounts it should be about 20 years. Uh, seven years for each wife and an additional six years uh, taking care of Laban's sheep and goats, uh, and he faces his fears and his wronged brother as he's heading back to the land. Uh, Jacob prays to God. This is only the, the, if you count Abraham standing in front of God and interceding on behalf of the, uh, the uh, people of Sodom and Gomorrah, that would be considered prayer number one. I don't necessarily consider that to be prayer number one myself because God's standing right next to him, you know, and he's talking to him. Although you could consider that an intercessory prayer. I frankly consider the prayer of Eliezer as he's going to meet the bride of of, um, Isaac to be the first recorded prayer in the Bible, and that's a fantastic prayer. Uh, that's a prayer for, it's almost like a traveler's prayer. I'm on a journey and I'm looking, for, uh, I'm looking for something and I need you to guide me along the way. And that's a fantastic prayer. This, this prayer of Jacob in chapter 32 is the first prayer in the Bible where someone is calling out to God in need. And that I, I really, really enjoyed. And I think it's a model prayer for that very reason. So we'll deal with that a little bit. He's going to give gifts to his brother in order to placate him. And he's going to try to form a strategy to prevent his own destruction by his brother Esau. And then he's going to have a midnight wrestling session with God, a man, an angel, something. Okay. Next we have... In chapter 33, he actually gets together with, uh, with Esau, and there is a, a, some type of reconciliation. It, there is some question about whether this is a true reconciliation or not, not really sure. We have the idea that we discussed a few years back when we studied this section regarding whether Jacob was actually trying to give back the blessing that he stole <coughs> from his brother Esau. That's a, an interesting idea to take a look at. And unfortunately, he seems to continue in a little bit of deceit and heads the wrong direction. We'll do that. We'll deal with that a little bit. Uh, And then in in chapter 34, we have the episode in Shechem. He is in the wrong place at the wrong time. And his daughter Dinah is raped and the town of Shechem is pillaged and all the people are murdered. It's a horrible, horrible scene. Nothing goes right in that chapter. Uh, And then chapter 35, we have a course correction and spiritual cleansing where God says, you know, get out of here. Go to where I want you to go. And he goes there, but before he does, they bury idols. Apparently there are idols in their midst, in their company of people. Uh, they, They cleanse themselves. So they have a period of spiritual cleansing and then they go up to Bethel, the house of God. And they're on their journey south. And then in chapter 35, again, Jacob rejoins his father for a little while. We don't know how long. His father, Isaac, dies, and he and his brother Esau bury their father at the age of 180. Yeah, it's hard to believe. Yeah, indeed. You know, it's 180. What's interesting to me also is you've got to consider that, you know, how old was Abraham when he died? 175 years. And then you got 180 years for his son Isaac. Uh, and, you know, he didn't have that son Isaac until he was 100. Okay. So this, this family 
has has kind of been around longer than the United States has existed almost. You imagine that just the longevity of the generations of, from Abraham to, to Jacob and his sons. You know how long Jacob lived. I don't remember exactly what. 147. Yeah, there you go. Right. So this is a, yeah, that's what he says to Pharaoh. But this is a long stretch of time that is just such a long period of time for just this family. Uh, Yes, indeed. And, and I think we need to remember, you know, for ourselves as we're reading these stories, and I've mentioned this to you before, and I'll just reiterate, that we're looking at a very long period of time with the highlights, the peaks, and the valleys, not the stuff in between. This is not a blow-by-blow. Blow. These are the peaks and highlights, and probably just a selection of them, of the t- period of the patriarchs, which informs us regarding what is our ancestry and where do we come from spiritually. So it's hard because you kind of look at Bible characters and you say, man, God is talking to them all the time and miracles are happening here and there. And it's like, no, this is a handful over a period of 180 years, you know. So it's like, don't expect that in your life. I don't think he did either. Uh, so there's chapter 35. And then chapter 36 is the told out the generations of Esau. Note that Amalek is listed there. It's quite a story there. Um, But I want to start a little bit with a little bit of reading. We haven't been able to do a lot of reading, uh, but I've I've chosen this time to take out a couple of of brief sections that I want to read to you so that we can discuss a little bit. I want to refresh you if you haven't had a chance to read it this week. This is from Genesis uh, 32, starting in verse 4, and I'm, I probably will jump around just a little bit, but I'll, I'll key you into that, okay? Genesis 32, verse 4 starts off and says that Jacob sent messengers ahead of him to Esau, his brother, toward the land of Seir, the country of Edom, with these instructions. Here is what you are to say to my lord Esau. Your servant Jacob says, I have been living with Laban and have stayed until now. I have cattle, donkeys, and flocks, and male and female servants. I am sending to tell this news to my Lord in order to win your favor. The messengers returned to Yaakov, saying, We went to your brother Esau, and he is coming to meet you with 400 men. Yaakov became greatly afraid and distressed. He divided the people, flocks, cattle, and camels with him into two camps, saying, If Esav comes to the one camp and attacks it, at least the camp that is left will escape. It's picking up in chat verse 10. Then Yaakov said, this is his prayer, God of my father Abraham and God of my father Yitzhak, Yehovah, who told me, return to your country and your kinsmen, and I will do you good. I have been made small because of all the love and faithfulness you have shown your servant, since I crossed the Jordan with only my staff. But now I have become two camps. Please rescue me from my brother Esav. I'm afraid of him, afraid he'll come and attack me without regard for mothers or children. You said, I will certainly do you good and make your descendants as numerous as the grains of sand by the sea, which are so many that they can't be counted. He stayed there that night. Then he chose from among his possessions a present for Esav, his brother. So, I want to briefly pause here for a moment and note in verse 11 that it says, I have been made small because of all the love and the faithfulness you have shown your servant. Now, your translation, does anyone have a translation that says, I have been made small? It probably... My translation says very little of what you're saying there. Isn't that interesting? I translated this literally from the Hebrew, especially that sentence, okay? Because a lot of your Bibles in, in chapter 32, verse 10, are going to say something quite different. 
I am, uh, I'm not worthy of the kindness and the grace that you have shown to me. What are some of your other translations say? Well, mine says, I am not worthy of the least of all the mercies and of all the truth which you have shown your servant. Mm -hmm. For I crossed over this Jordan with my staff, and now I have come, become two companies. Yep. That's, it's fascinating, but when you look at the, the literal Hebrew translation of this, and this is where I, I studied some of the, the lore regarding this, it's a, it's a curious phrase. It says, um, Ketoneti mikol hachasdim yu mikol. Small because of the mercies and truth. That's that, that first word, it starts off with that first word, katoneti, katoneti, katon is the root that says to be small and insignificant. It's literally the translation. Uh, and, and I thought to myself, how do we get I'm not worthy from I have been made small because of all of the kindness and the truth that you have shown me? What do you, how would you, if you were a rabbi or, you know, you were reading this in the Hebrew back in the day and you're looking at this translation and you'd see that it literally says, I, it literally starts off with the word small because of the grace and the truth that you have shown me. The only way they can translate it literally is I have become small because of all the great things you've done for me. That's it. That's what the rabbis have suggested about this passage is that when you realize the magnitude of the grace and the truth that God has shown you, it shows you that you are not worthy, you're certainly not worthy of these things, but it also makes you keenly aware of how you have a lot to live up to, that you look at what he's done and you say, I haven't even, I haven't done what I should with what you've given me. We haven't even asked for the right things. We haven't, yeah, absolutely. We haven't even asked for the right things. It's just a, it was a profound sentiment to me to see what that said in the Hebrew original and to think about it and think, yeah, when you recognize not only how great God's goodness is and how small that makes you, it's just a stunning, it's a stunning thought. It's a humbling thought. And so I just wanted to pause on that particular phrase for just a moment and discuss that. But now I'm going to jump forward just a little bit to verse 22. In chapter 32, verse 22, it says, I took a little break there, uh, he presented these presents. And so the presents crossed over ahead of him because they had crossed over the Jabbok River, which is interesting too, because the word Yabok in Hebrew means emptied out. It's almost like what's happening to Jacob here. He's being emptied out. So, he pre so the present crossed over ahead of him, and he himself stayed that night in the camp. He got up that night, took his two wives, his two slave girls, and his eleven children, and forded the Yabbok. He took them and sent them across the stream, then sent his possessions across, and Yaakov was left alone. Then some man wrestled with him until daybreak. When he saw that he did not defeat Yaakov, he struck Yaakov's hip socket so that his hip was dislocated while wrestling with him. The man said, let me go because it's daybreak. But Yaakov replied, I won't let you go unless you bless me. And the man asked, what is your name? And he said, Yaakov. Then the man said, from now on, you will no longer be called Yaakov, but Israel, because you have shown strength to both God and men and have prevailed. And Yaakov asked him, please tell me your name. But he answered, why are you asking about my name? And he blessed him there. That's a fascinating, fascinating section. Um, and we'll get... Mm -hmm. He knew he had seen something for sure. Uh, yeah, he calls the place Peni El, which means the face of God, and he comments on it and says, I have seen God face to face, and I am alive. Uh, it reminds me a little bit of Hagar when she met God and said, this is the man, this is, 
pretty amazing. So there's a, a fascinating section, and let's, I, I want to dig into this portion especially. So taking a look between chapters 20, 32 and 33 at what I, can, what I have phrased here, tangible and spiritual sides of dealing with enemies. Okay? Now, you know how I am in trying to be clever at turning a phrase. Uh, we have different types of enemies that we need to consider. Now, first, we have Esau has become an enemy of Jacob. Why has Esau become an enemy of Jacob? Is it just... Threatened to kill him. Yeah, he threatened to kill him. Well, why? He's ripping off Esau. Because he tricked him. He stole his birthright. He stole his birthright. Well, he stole it. It's okay. He, he stole it. Now, he didn't, he didn't steal his birthright exactly. He traded it for a bowl of soup. But, but what did he steal? He stole his blessing. Okay, so, in a sense, what was that blessing? Was that a blessing? And we need to remember what that blessing was. What was the substance of that blessing from Jacob? Does anyone remember? Okay, yes, absolutely. He would that he would rule over his brother. Yeah. Provision, provision, provision in the world. So this is a two-part blessing. It is the the dew of heaven and then and, and crops and herds and flocks and and fruitfulness from yourself plus some spiritual lordship kind of ideas. And so we have this idea of the blessing that he took from Esau was both a temporal and a spiritual blessing. Now, he has become his enemy because of his own grasping. Because of his own grasping. I know you, you may have heard this story before, and it's, it's, it's interesting. Uh, regarding, well, I don't need to tell that story, but it, it, it's about having open hands to receive what God gives rather than reaching and taking what God gives. You heard that story about the rabbi with the apple? There's like a group, of, a group of, of rabbinic students who was sitting next to this old wizened rabbi listening to him talk, and he, he recognized Rabbi David Aaron he was when he was a young man, and he said, come, on, come forward. It was his first meeting with this ancient rabbi, and he was holding out an apple, and he said, take it. And all the students around him were like, take it, take it, take it. Well, he reached out for it, and the guy pulled it back, and said, all the students said, no, no. <laughs> so he held it out again. And so he started to reach for it, and all the students said, no, no. He didn't know, what the heck am I doing wrong? He's holding out the apple to me. And then he saw all the students going like this. And so he reached out his hand underneath the apple, and the rabbi let the, rap, let the apple fall into his hand. And then he said to the student, what have you been studying? <laughs> so it was an interesting story. And it's, a, it's an object lesson in this in particular, which is, even, you know, Rachel, you know, or um, Rebecca, excuse me, went about seizing that blessing that she had from God instead of waiting and seeing in what way God would work. You know, I think that they really robbed themselves of the power of seeing God work in that situation when it seems like, how is this even possible? How is it that the, the, the younger is going to rule over the older? That, does, that goes against everything. We don't know how God would have worked that out because she took the opportunity right out of his mouth and robbed herself of that blessing. Angela? Or how the old woman is going to have the child because she tried to circumvent it. Now, well, when we know that we want something and possibly even really humanly need, desperately need something, then we're trying to, we're praying, but we're trying to, trying to do it ourselves anyway. Mm -hmm. I think that's similar. That is very similar. That is very similar. And, and we have to... We have to, well, we have to do a couple of things, and we're coming to that in a moment a little bit more deeply, but, you know, I also heard from a, a wonderful teacher one time. He said that uh, 
you know, the, these challenges that you face in your life are the greatest opportunities to see the works of God and to be incredibly blessed. But they are also fraught with difficulty because our tendency is to screw them up. When you grasp and you fret and you run to and fro trying to solve the problem yourself, you rob yourself of that blessing. And often we take an incorrect or even uh, unscrupulous or unethical or frankly a violation of the Torah in some way. We may lie, cheat, or steal in order to get what we want because we're frantic and we're afraid. Fear is the mind killer. Yeah. It's a terrible, terrible tragedy to, to, to succumb to fear. And we'll talk about fear a little bit more this evening. But that's the natural human inclination is to be stricken by fear. But I, I want to talk about that in just a couple of minutes. But grasping and taking those things that we even rightly know that God wants us to have precludes so many blessings for, for us. And Jacob shot himself in the face. He may not have had to gone to Uncle Laban at all in that way and worked for 20 years. He never, However, he never saw his mother again. No, it doesn't. No, it doesn't seem like he did, and he probably only saw his father for the last little bit of time. But that's also a result of his making it more dis bad decisions. So we'll talk about that. However, we'll come to that in just a second. The second type of enemy that he came across was Laban himself. Now Jacob didn't do anything to Laban. He didn't try to trick Laban and he didn't use some nefarious means to get what he wanted from Laban. So you really are presented here with two different types of enemies, two different types of challenges. One, you create for yourself. You create your own problems and we know that that's the case. We we, I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself, but we create so many problems for ourselves. It just happens. But there are other times when things happen like Laban, taking advantage of him, switching, well, switching the wife around was obviously payback. <laughs> a little bit of karma, uh, sowing and reaping going on for, I mean, yeah, measure for measure. That was, that was destined for him to learn a valuable lesson. But Uncle Laban changing his wages ten times, trying to rip him off. You know, every time he saw things going Jacob's way, he's like, let's change the deal. So God just kept changing the deal. Laban would change the deal, and God would change the deal. It's because uh, Jacob was blessed. It was, he absolutely. Was blessed with material wealth. And Laban couldn't stop it. Couldn't stop it. Couldn't stop it. But he tried. He tried. And that is the other type of an enemy that we'll face is someone who seemingly has no reason to harm us. And unfortunately, it's often the people who are closest to us or even family. That's really unfortunate. But there you have these two different types of, of, uh, of enemies. Then there's a, there's a third type, but we'll come to that in just a moment. Remember this yabak, that he, this was being emptied out. And you can really sense that, that situation here where Jacob is in the position of, frankly, the possibility of losing everything. And he does lose quite a bit. You kind of have to anticipate. He, yeah, he's got great flocks and herds and great wealth when he comes out of Padan Aram, in between the, the land between the rivers in Mesopotamia. But when he, how much does he give to his brother Esau in order to pay him back for the, 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 the way that he robs him? It's a tremendous, vast amount of wealth. So I'm guessing that he lost a significant portion of his wealth to make up for his wrongs. And there's a whole separate lesson there. Angela? That varies by what he stole, but yes, in the Torah, when a thief steals something, he has to pay back at a minimum double, okay. sometimes more. It I depends just upon. If there was a correlation between what he gave back to Esau and what he had taken. Yeah, I, yeah that's a great question, um, and I don't know precisely, but it's like, for example, if you steal a sheep, you have to pay back a certain number of sheep, but if you steal someone's ox, you have to pay back even more. Why would that be? Livelihood. livelihood, yes. The ox is your livelihood. A sheep represents wealth. If you've got one, you probably have a few. Uh, but if you've got an ox, you're not likely to have a whole bunch of those. That's a very expensive beast of burden. 
Yeah, that's like yeah. your tractor, absolutely. Yeah. So you take, that's like taking a millstone in pledge, you know what I'm saying? That's how I'm going to grind my bread or my coat. You know, you got to give it back to him. You've got to sleep in it and he'll bless you. If he, if he comes to me and complains about you, I will hear it. So, absolutely. So he's, um, he's being emptied out in a sense. He's being emptied out in a sense in what he had to pay back to his brother. Curious thought that you might want to consider and remind yourself every once in a while. Everything that the adversary has stolen from you in your life has to be paid back. A minimum of double. Think Torah doesn't account? Do you think the Torah doesn't apply to the adversary? You bet it does. When the punishment of the adversary comes down and all the things that he has stolen and robbed from God's people, all the things he has stolen and uh, it's taken for his own purposes from God, it all has to be paid back. Every bit of it. Angela? New wine into old wineskins. Right, but there's something, that, and she alluded to this in her paper, something about emptying it out and then filling it to the brim, and, and it related it to a whole bunch of stuff. So hmm. take a look at that. It's a, it's a long paper, but it, it really, there's, there's something with this. Absolutely. Yeah, there's, a, there's something, there's a lot of something. Yabak. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yep, that's the name of the river that he crossed over. Yeah. Uh, so, so there's that little section about em en enemies. I said enemies. Uh, the spiritual side of this trouble. So what is the source of the trouble? This is where we have to, I, we have, to have a little bit of wisdom and discernment to discern the sources of trouble in our lives. Jacob himself is the source of certain part of this trouble. And, and unfortunately, you'll recall in your own life, I'm certain, that many, many of the challenges and difficulties that you have faced in your life were probably of your own making. I can, I can tell you that that's the thing that really troubles me, frankly, when I look back over my life and I see the troubles and difficulties that I have had I got to tell you that 90 something percent of them were all caused by me either just being foolish with different parts of my life making dumb mistakes getting ahead of God snatching trying to snatch blessings there's frankly not a whole lot that I can see in my life and you know I've talked with many of you and I've talked with a lot of people regarding the challenges in their lives and unfortunately, the bulk of them come from just dumb things that we've done that come back to us. It's just, it's the, the laws that God has put into place. Mm -hmm. But there are those situations where trouble comes and it has nothing to do with you. It's not your fault. Now, the, the glorious thing is, and the kindness and the truth that God shows us and what makes us feel small is that even in the midst of our own blunders, He gives us grace. To, 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 now, Peter tells us, man, don't suffer as a troublesome meddler and an evildoer. Well, you know, what good is it to suffer with patience you know, the, the, the heap of trouble that you've brought on yourself but unfortunately, that's the bulk of what we're dealing with, is just our own stupidity, our own bad decisions. But the good news is that God brings grace to both of these situations, and most especially to troubles that come upon you that you had nothing to do with. The most important thing in either case is how you respond. How you respond to these these enemies, these troubles that come your way is absolutely critical. If you look at what Jacob does here, he is trying to make amends. And this is right. This is the right thing to do. This is what the Torah tells us when we sin against a brother. We have to express repentance. He comes on his face 
to his brother and calls him Lord. I am your servant. Take this blessing. When, when your text says he presented this to him and said, Here's a, my, take my present. That's not what the text says. The text use, uses the same exact word for the blessing that he stole. He is saying, take this blessing. It has, frankly, become a curse to me. And that is what happens if you read in the Proverbs, the, the, the you know, stolen bread is sweet, but it brings death. And I think he is seeing that the trouble, many of the troubles that have come upon him are the result of what he has done. So, identifying the source of these trouble. The, God uses the sin in our own lives to correct our souls. That's what I would say about these two things that we deal with. When we make mistakes and we suffer for it and we endure with patience, the trouble that comes upon us because of what we've done ourselves, there's even some redemption in that. You know, and I know, at least I believe you do, that you don't get what you deserve. Right? You don't get what you deserve. I don't want what I deserve because the things that I have done in my life that have been stupid, I have had to pay for them. But boy, it doesn't seem like I've had to pay for them as much as I ought to have. And that is a rich, rich blessing. A very rich blessing. That's grace. Very much grace. So that's the good news is that these, these sins that we engage in that purify our souls and teach us regarding bad behavior, it's just discipline. It's just discipline. And we learn from this discipline, but it's, it's gracious discipline. It's such a tremendous blessing. Um, and, and, and so he uses our own sin to teach us. This is the great power that he has in our lives. Uh, but we, we, and Paul anticipates that we will think about this. And he said, well, should we then continue in sin so that grace will increase? May it never be. Don't you realize that you've been cleansed of sins? You, know, you don't have to keep living that way. Man, that just talks about the mindset that you have. And this is where some of these other issues come in, is this mindset that you're dealing with. Um, you know, consider yourself dead to sin and alive to the Messiah, living in the Spirit instead of living in the flesh. Tremendous wisdom and insight, but man, the amount of this spirituality, if you want to put it that way, that deals with the way we think is so, so important. And I don't, I, don't, I don't go on any weird trips about, you know, think and grow rich or, uh, you know, the power of positive thinking. Although I think that those are, are spectacular uh, truths from the Bible that have been twisted all out of proportion. There is great truth and great power to the way that you think. There really is. And I'll, and I'll come to, to a little bit more about that in just a moment. Uh, consider, for example, that when these troubles hit us, that we are instantly pummeled with fear and anxiety. Whether it's, the, whether it's the results of our own sin coming home to roost with us, or some outside force that is coming against us, or some completely unforeseen thing that we had nothing to do with that, that suddenly brings trouble to our mind, news comes. Your brother is coming to see you with 400 men. Why does my brother need 400 men to come and greet me back home? You know, that's an army. In those days, that's a fairly sizable army. Remember that Abraham went and defeated those five kings with 318 men. Esau is coming with 400 men. And Esau is a man of the field and a hunter and a, and a trapper of men. And he's, he's uh, a little bit of an animal. And so it, it, this news that strikes Jacob, it strikes fear into his heart. Uh, so these, you got to watch out that I think it's entirely natural when these things hit us to, to experience that fear and that doubt and that anxiety. There's nothing you can do about that. There's just not. That's your human body. That's your human mind. That's the way things work. God wired you that way, that when you experience fear, your adrenaline pumps, you get all kinds of weird chemicals flooding through your body, you might have to go potty, you feel like you can't breathe. It's 
difficult, challenging things. That's a physiological reaction to bad news. You know that it's the, 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 pro, the Proverbs also tell us that uh, a, a, a good word soothes the soul. You know, when, when, when you have been fretting and, 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 and gnawing your teeth uh, for a couple of weeks until you get the results back from the doctor, and when he says, hey, we got a pill we're going to give you, and it's going to fix you up. Whether that's true or not, or whether it rarely works, <laughs> it's like, Man, I just feel better. <laughs> I just feel better. Hopefully that happens in a lot of cases, and it has, and it does. But the news that we hear, and that's why I have warned you on multiple occasions to be careful about the news that you ingest. Because the look at around the world and you see, man, there are crazy people slaughtering Jews. There's no question that anti-Semitism is on the rise in America and in other countries. It is rising its ugly head again, very strongly. Uh, we've had more anti-Semitic attacks in America in just the last couple of years than we had for many years before that, uh, which is it's odd. It's odd, but it's not. It's a spiritual malady that just keeps coming back in cycles, it feels like. We're bringing in hundreds of thousands of people from the other side of the planet. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Anti-Semitism, what about it? Yesterday. Yesterday? Yesterday? No, no, they Trump passed a... That's right, executive order, yeah. Yeah. Whether or not they can keep it. Yeah, whether they'll do anything or not, I don't know. They but also did like a, some, Hanukkah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, for for uh, Yeah, it's the twenty second. Um but you know, you, you kinda look around and you and you the the news that you see out there can, can cause fear, but it's most most notably the fear that you feel from your own personal circumstances. But there is a general sense of just anxiety that you can feel from just seeing the news out there. Uh, so what's interesting, and I want you to, to really pay attention to this, is that unfortunately what happens in my own estimation, and you can tell me whether you agree or disagree, is that your own internal fear and anxiety and uncertainty can unfortunately combine, I think, with the whispered lies of the adversary. And I think that that is the spiritual realm. I know that this is weird and we don't often talk about the adversary and the, the, the spiritual forces. The Bible clearly tells us in so many cases of spiritual adversaries, spiritual forces that are taking place. I don't go too deep on that because I, you know, I was involved in that when I was a kid and I thought it was rather wacky and I didn't want to put that much emphasis on it, but it is a very real thing. And I think that the, the adversary, we have to know the truth or we can't push these things back. We also have to remind ourselves of the truth continuously or we can't push our own minds in the right direction. But I want to remind you of something here. God, in my, my opinion, I have some backup for this, but I want to get your thoughts on it. God will not give you the grace to deal with what you imagine. He will give you the grace to deal with the truth. Uh, oh, 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 oh. That's a tough thing. God will not give you the grace to deal with what you imagine. He will only give you the grace to deal with reality. When you, when you experience a, some health scare and you have all these ideas and fears running around in your mind, it's this, it's that, it's a deadly disease, it's something that the doctors don't even know what it is and I'm going to die from it, there's no cure. You know how your mind is. It runs through all of these negative scenarios that are not founded in reality, God can't help you with that. It's not real. It's a phantom. 
And, and the only way that God can help you with that, and I, and I would modify my statement slightly by saying, I have given you truth to combat that, but I'm not going to crawl inside your mind and push these out of your mind. That's your job. You have a certain part to play in this. I will give you grace to deal with the reality. You have to marshal your own inner resources to grasp onto my truth and push back against the lies. Just real quick, in, in the work that I do, we call that what if. That what if thinking, yes. And there is nothing in the Bible that supports what if thinking. That's right. That's absolutely right. I couldn't agree with you more, Jan. And I have, uh, I, have, I, <laughs> I have a couple of statements that I have in my phone that I read to myself periodically because I struggle with this stuff just like you guys do. Here are a couple of my things. Do not ruminate about anything. Just thinking things over. It's useless. Don't do it. Don't believe everything you think. <laughs> Sounds kind of silly, but it's the truth. Don't believe everything you think. Just because you think it doesn't mean it's true. Here's another one. Don't assume facts not in evidence. It's like from a court case. Uh, delay worry until designated worry time. That never happens. <laughs> it's like, I'm not going to worry about this now. I'm going to set aside some special time to worry. You just forget about it. <laughs> Jerry? I think probably one of our biggest worries is like when you've got bills due, mm -hmm. you know how much you owe and you know how much is coming in. And the coming in just doesn't quite have to match up with what's going on. And Every day you get closer, you get a little more anxious. Yeah. Yep. Yes, you, you do. Know, and when it's two weeks out, it's no big deal. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, yes. That, that's true of medical yeah. operations. Yeah. The closer yeah. you get to it, the more you stress. Absolutely. And you Absolutely. Absolutely. And I would say that is, uh, you know, there are, and you can see these in the Bible. It's repeated in the Psalms, it's repeated in the Proverbs, and there are just these metaphorical stories that you see repeatedly that there are certain things that strike at the heart of a man. His money, his, his uh, health, and his family. Women and men. Health, money, family. What else is there? That's no, there's really nothing else. Those are the three things that get your goat every time. Money, health, and family. These are the worries we have. These are the worries that we have. And unfortunately, some of these things you have a certain, you have to be able to discern what can I, what is my area of purview? What do I have purview over? I have to work, right? Mm -hmm. I have to work. I have to do the best I can with what God has given me. If I'm physically capable of working, I have to work. If God does not, through my diligence and my willingness to work and my good attitude, provide me enough to meet my needs, then there's a miracle coming. There just has to be, doesn't there? It's, you, could, you should expect that. There are caveats to that. I have gotten myself in over my head. I bought more house than I could afford. I've, I've, my, my, my egg that I need to make every month is really unrealistic. Yes, you can get yourself into some troubling situations that you might need to extricate yourself from. But if you're working and doing the best you can, anything beyond that is God. If I am taking decent care of my body, anything beyond that is God. If I'm maintaining my relationships and loving my wife and being faithful to her and I'm loving my children, if they get stricken with some disease, what does control do I have of that? Absolutely nothing. We must determine what do we have control over and what do we not have control over. And, the, and each of those things has its own set of concerns. And we need to begin to learn to push back on the fear and the doubt and the, the attack of the adversary, and only truth can push back against those things. But remember what I told you, and you can tell me what your thoughts are on that later, but God will not give you grace to deal with what you imagine, only with reality. So remember, 
Your imagination is a powerful thing. Use it for good. Don't use it for evil. And, and I think that this, this wrestling match with Jacob keenly illustrates this, that Jacob thinks he is... Re- what, is what does Jacob think is happening here? Does he suddenly, he's in the dark and he gets jumped by some, he thought, he thinks that Esau got him. Well, who else could it be? He doesn't realize that it's God until the sun comes up. He's He's wrestling. Oh, absolutely. But imagine, he's, he, the sun has gone down, it's dark, he has sent his family across the other side of the river, he's over here by himself, who's he expecting to meet? His brother. He's waiting for his brother to arrive. All of a sudden, somebody jumps out of the dark and starts wrestling with him? He's got to think that it's his brother. It's only until the sun comes up that he realizes who he is dealing with. How does that not illustrate does that not illustrate exactly the point we have been talking about? You don't know what you're wrestling with until the sun comes up, until the truth is revealed. Angela? Light. Light is shown on the subject, and you suddenly become aware. I'm wrestling with God. And here's something I would then remind you that you can extrapolate from this story. Everything that you're dealing with is God. You are fighting with God. And when the lights come on, you will suddenly realize, I haven't been fighting with my health issue. I haven't been fighting with my money issue. I've been fighting with God. Now, what happens when you struggle with God and you prevail? You get you lose. <laughs> Noel, yes. But no, God, and remember that God is like a, a most wonderful parent ever. When you wrestled with your children when they were a kid, was it your objective to body slam them and jump on top of them and kick them across the room and say, ha ha? No, of course not. You wanted them to win, to strengthen them, to encourage them. God is not intending to body slam you and then bury you in the dirt and stick your face in the mud and give you a wedgie and laugh at you. He's wrestling with you because he wants you to win. But once you realize who you're wrestling with, that changes your whole perspective. Angela? You said what happens um, when you wrestle with God and prevail? Mm-hmm. Your walk is visibly changed. Yes. That's Yes. His life, you can look at the way he walked, and he was walking different. And I think that that is the spiritual. Yeah. Life. There's so many Your different. So many different and wonderful. You get a new name. What's in a name? A reputation, character. What does Israel mean? Israel could mean a whole number of things. That's really a bit of a mystery. Uh, it could be. Uh, Prince of God, it could be struggles with God. Um, the word, the root word for Abraham's wife, Sarah, is also buried in there. There's a whole slew of things that that could possibly mean. It's a very mysterious thing, but your name is changed, your character is changed, your walk is changed when you come face to face with God and you wrestle with God and you realize you've been wrestling with God. Fascinating insight regarding the struggles that we go through from this struggle that Jacob experiences here. So in the dark we get confused, but when the lights come on we realize what we're struggling with and it opens our eyes and it changes our perspective. Um, the, our soul corrections and our faith building, it's always God. It's always God. That's something that you should remember for yourself. Whatever you're dealing with, it's God. It's always God. What is he trying to show me? What does he want me to do? How should I react? Don't think about, now like I said, you think about, well, everything that I'm dealing with is God. Yes. Whether it's the result of your own foolishness, whatever's coming upon you is God bringing you the, the, the recompense for what you've done, not for the purpose of destroying you, but for the purpose of correcting you. 
So, in that case, it's God. Some weird thing comes out of nowhere that you have no control over at all. Who do you think that is? That's God. He definitely he either does it or allows it. The, the adversary is just God's dog, does his bidding every single time. But the, the, what, is, what is the spiritual component then? That's the mind stuff, where, where, the, where the whispered lies of the adversary get mixed up with your own thoughts. That's spiritual attack, in my, my estimation. And I'm sure there's caveats and you know, lots of little stuff you can add to that. Angela? <laughs> That's a good way to look at it. It really is. Yes, and if you couldn't hear, Angela said, what does a sheepdog do? The sheepdog bites at the heels of the sheep to get him to go in the direction that the master wants. The adversary, the devil, is a prowling sheepdog, prowling around looking for ankles to bite. Something to go along with what Angela just said, that if you've got a sheep that's really rebellious, sometimes God will, or the shepherd will break his leg. <laughs> yeah. Seriously, that's what they yes. Say. And this makes the sheep totally dependent on the shepherd. Absolutely. He's healing, and most of the time they come around. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, I, we've mentioned that before in our discussions, too. God will use a still, small voice. He'll use a tap on the shoulder, and then he'll bring out the baseball bat. I know that I, myself, tend to need the baseball bat. Yeah in many cases. Angela? Before he gets to the bat, he uses that staff. And I don't know if you've seen the videos on YouTube of the sheep yeah. herders. They grab, they, they use their staff to grab one of the sheep's legs so that now it only has three legs. And it stops it from running around. Now it has to stand still because it's only got three. <laughs> that one that's in the, the hook. Yeah. And I think that he does that to us a lot. He, he hooks our fourth leg so that we will stop and stand still. <laughs> Yeah. These are fantastic metaphors, aren't they? <laughs> the, the, the lessons of God bringing f that he brings forth in his Torah, these stories are absolutely true and 100% real and they are historical fact and yet he shows us these amazing uh, things in our lives through these stories. It's, it's just so tremendous to me. Now the practical side of trouble. This is you have to do what you can do. You know? What does Jacob do? He says, well, I'm going to most likely take half of my goods with my servants and put them in one camp, and then I'm going to take my family with the other half of my goods and put them in another camp. And I'm going to arrange it in such a way that somebody's going to survive. He's being strategic uh, in order to protect himself and his family and his assets. In fact, you could, if you're a financial advisor, you might think this is a lesson about diversification. <laughs> Diversifying your investments. He was, he was completely prey at that point. He had no inkling of, oh, I'm going to stand and fight. He's like, I'm no. going to lose, so let's lose half. Yeah, yeah. He, he very, very much felt like he's going to lose, so let's not lose it as much. Let's lose as little as possible. But, I, but the, the, he had to throw himself upon the mercy of his brother, period. And I think primarily he was throwing himself upon the mercy of God because he prayed to God and said, my brother wants to kill me and there's nothing I can do about it. You're going to have to soften his heart if I'm going to withstand the onslaught of my brother. And so he bowed himself to the, with the face to the ground in regards to the person that he had wronged. He paid back and he humbled himself. A perfect example of repentance and humbling and seeking amends. Isn't that what he's going to say when, he's, when he hugs his brother? He says, your face is like the face of God. Yes, and that's a, that's a puzzling Which thing for a lot of people, a very puzzling thing yeah. to say. Why would he say, man, seeing your face is like seeing the face of God? Because he is seeing the face of God. Esau is representing to him the power of God in his life. It's not that he's, I don't think, it, may, it doesn't make any sense to me to think of Esau as God. So that's not the way I think we should take it. I think we should take it as, you are the power of God in my life. Take it in that way, if nothing else. So, dividing 
and trying to prevent a total loss and making amends for wrong. Being truly humble, being truly repentant, and seeking to make corrections. That's something that we've talked about before, which we are sorely lacking in a lot of Western culture, is taking full responsibility for the sins that we commit. It's very, very challenging for people these days to even admit that they've done something wrong, let alone make actual amends for it. Pay back. That maybe doesn't have to be something stolen, but just fessing up, saying I'm sorry, trying to make corrections. Challenging, very, very challenging in these days. So let's set an example uh, for ourselves and for the people around us to uh, truly be humble, truly be repentant, to truly do what is right. Because that's a, that's a huge, huge witness. When very few people are doing what is right, when you do even something small, that is right, you kind of stand out like a sore thumb. Did you want to say something, Angela? Not yet. Okay. Before you're done. Yeah, absolutely. So here's Genesis 33. I want to point out just a couple of things to you regarding Genesis 33. I'm going to read, as you can see, uh, a few snippets. And this is regarding the path that Jacob took, uh, both when he first comes back into the land and then after he settles things with his brother. So in Genesis 33, verse 3, it says, Then he himself passed on ahead of his wives and children and prostrated himself to the ground seven times before approaching his brother. And then in verse 14, if you skip down to verse 14, he's already dealt with his brother. He's given him the stuff. He's explained where he was. He gives him all the goods. And then he says, uh, you know, hey, come with me. And he's like, no. Uh, you go on ahead of me, in verse 14, I will travel more slowly at the pace of the cattle ahead of me and at the pace of the children until I come to my Lord in Seir. So he, Harry. So he says, I'm going where you're going, but I'm not going to travel with you because you're a band of warriors on horses and such. You know, I'm, uh, we're moving... We're, we got with little kids and small animals and such, and we can't move at your pace. But I'm going where you're going. We're going to Seir too. Then in verse 17, it says, Jacob went to Sukkot, mm -hmm. where he built himself a house and put up shelters for his cattle, and this is why the place is called Sukkot. This is the first instance of the word Sukkot, by the way. Fascinating study. Not the last. Not the last. Now here's something I want to show you. This is not a high quality map, I apologize, it's hard to find one. Here's Jacob's line of coming back down from Padan Aram, and here is Peni El and the Jabbok River right here. He's getting ready to cross over the Jordan River, so he meets his brother somewhere here, and then he crosses over, and his brother's headed down this way to, towards Mount Seir, and he says, yeah, I'm coming to follow you. Does he? No, he does not at all. He heads north. He goes completely the opposite direction. He goes north towards Shechem, where all of these terrible, terrible things happen. Makes you wonder why. Okay, then, is he in the right place? When you look at... Go ahead, Jimmy. Does he belong in Mount Seir? Does he belong in Mount Seir? I think so. No, he, well, 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 that's a good that's question. That is where Esau lives. Now, where is his dad? Does anybody know where his dad is? As far as we know, yeah, his dad is still alive. His father is down here in Hebron, in southern Israel. So when he crosses over into Israel, he turns north. He told his brother he was going south. He just can't come through. He can't... Yeah, the net, yeah, and they moved again. But what is... Now, I want to remind you of something. Take a look at Genesis 31. Take a look at Genesis 31. 31, <coughs> verse 3. This is what God says to him while he is still in the land of Uncle Laban. In verse 3, 3 of chapter 31, God says to him, 
Vayomer Adonai el Yaakov, return to the land of your fathers and your kindred. And what? Your kindred, your family. Return to the land of your fathers and your family. Not return to the land of your fathers and the land of your family. Return to the land of your fathers. Return to your family. Did he return to his family? He did not. He returned to the land, but he did not return to his family. God specifically told him two parts of this instruction. Cross that river and go back into the land. Go find your family. He did not. He went the wrong direction. Why? I don't know. I believe that it still has to do with his fear. And notice... What does he fear? He likely fears his brother still. I don't know that he still trusts his brother. I think he thinks he got away with that thing by the skin of his teeth and things could have gone much worse and probably will yet. Doesn't trust his brother. But interesting to note that when he heads north up to Shechem, what happens there? One of the men, one of the leaders of that place, snatch one of the women from his household. It's exactly what his father Abraham and his father Isaac feared would happen to their own wives, but did not. This time it does. It's a fascinating, fascinating piece of information here that I'm struggling frankly to figure out. Why did he go here? What is he doing? Why didn't he go where God told him to go? God seems to have specifically wanted him down south because here is his dad and here is his brother. But he went north. So is he in the right place? Absolutely he is not. Now what about this prophecy of Jacob bowing down, or, or, or the, the older becoming a servant to the younger. And here's Jacob bowing down to his brother. Why is that? Well, let me ask you a question. Have you ever, has this prophecy of the elder serving the younger happened? Since then or before that? Ever. Ever. It has never happened. David did indeed, and there's some significance in that, the only time that I'm aware of where the, 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 the descendants of Esau were bowing down to the descendants of Jacob was during the time of King David and King Solomon. The height yeah, of the kingdom. Definitely Solomon. definitely Solomon and definitely David. So, other than that, almost never. You remember aren't that... The, aren't the Edomites, the Palestinians, and that crowd over there today? Uh, very possibly. Very possibly, yes. Yeah, yeah, I have heard that. That's really speculative because those bloodlines are, they're lost. But yeah, it's a fair to middling guess. Yeah, absolutely. They do, and this is fascinating because what you think about is we have this prophecy repeated multiple times, but when are the when is the, is Jacob going to rule over the the house of Edom? Messianic age. It must be the messianic age, at the height of the kingdom. It must be. It has to be because the Jews. The Jews and the Israelites and the Hebrew people have been under the boot of Edom many, many times. And you know when a Jew today thinks about Edom, what are they thinking? That's, Christ, that's Christianity in general. Rome, Roman Christianity, the West. The Gentile West is Edom. The tribe of Benjamin is the most prideful tribe because Benjamin, when when all the when mom and dad, Jacob and all were all the brothers were bowing down to Uncle Esau, Benjamin had not been born yet, and so 
Yeah. He's the only one that didn't die. He's also the only one who was born in that land. He was born in that land. Yeah. And There's something very special about Benjamin. I don't know. It's a big, big mystery and lots of amazing things, but the tribe of Benjamin is very peculiar. I think, I think, um, I don't know, it's just completely speculation, but the Antichrist has to be somebody. I expect <laughs> him to be a son of Esau. But I expect the false prophet to be a son of Benjamin hmm. because we're, they're not going to get out of this without having screwed up. <laughs> I think the false prophet that gets the whole world to worship the uh, son of Esau is going to be a son of Benjamin. You know, it's interesting that you say that. I think um, for most Christians, they would assume that the anti-Messiah is a Jew. No way. Yeah. He comes out of the sea. Well, if he's going to trick the Jews, which is what most people think, that the anti-Messiah is going to trick the Jews into thinking he's a Messiah, doesn't he have to be a Jew? How are the Jews going to accept a foreign Messiah who is not from the line of David? I'm not suggesting to you that the Jews are going to birth a Messiah that's a false Messiah. I don't know. But to most Christians, the anti-Messiah will be a Jew. And to most Jews, the anti-Messiah will be a Christian. (laughs) Mm. of current events. Yeah. So if I heard this tossed about that <coughs> if, um, if there was a person that could um, somehow get rid of Islam mm. some way, shape or form and because of the persecution on Christianity and on the Jews from that group of people that if they, someone could annihilate them somehow or get rid of them, mm-hmm. they would be looked on as a Messiah sure. and be worshipped sure. because of that. I've heard that or too. Or if he could just bring, bring peace from the Muslim world sure. to is- Israel. That, yeah, that I've, I've heard that. Yeah, I've heard that as well. That's it's certainly a possibility. Another thing the sages say that if all 12 brothers had gotten their acts together, mm-hmm. that in their lives that the world could have been... Hmm. Yeah, there's certain there's certain precepts amongst Christians and Jews both that that we can somehow hasten the return of the Messiah by what we do in this world, uh, and there certainly does seem to be some scriptural support for that. But I find that har- to those people, do not do that. Yeah, no, I I understand. Okay. Hold on. I, I, there are people who believe that, and there are some passages in the Bible that you could take that way. I personally don't think that. I personally think that this is entirely upon God's time frame, and it has absolutely nothing to do with what you do. I don't know. I, I mean, I have some ideas about why people think that. I just think that there are passages that they might be misinterpreting. Um, but I want to just... I'm going to wrap up right here because we're running a little bit low on time and I'm going to have Angela comment for just a moment, but I'm going to put up on my last slide here some notes regarding things that you might want to check into, curiosities and interesting things regarding chapter uh, 34 and 35. I'm not terribly concerned about 36, but uh, the rape and pillage of Dinah slash Shechem. Notice that the, the, the relationship that is formed here is absolutely in reverse between Shechem and Dinah. They have sex, they fall, he falls in love with her, and then he wants to marry her, which is exactly backwards. Uh, what I feared has greatly come upon me. This is what I mentioned previously regarding the fear of Abraham and Isaac regarding what would happen to their wives in a strange land actually happens to Jacob. Uh, Shechem feels entitled to take what he wants with no consequences. Uh, Jacob's sons spoke with deceit in much the same way that their father had done when they tricked these people into being circumcised so they could slaughter all of them. Um, Righteousness, righteousness you shall pursue, which is a quote from the Torah, which is you have to conduct yourself in righteousness in a righteous way, meaning was it right for the inhabitants of Shechem, all of them, to be killed? Or was just Shechem responsible? 
in what way would the other inhabitants of the town be held responsible for the action of their leader? There is very much a shared sense of responsibility that is talked about in the Torah on many occasions. So, yes, we can become responsible for the sin of others in a way, which is a little bit unusual, but I want you to consider that. Um, in Genesis 35, with the spiritual cleansing, we have the burying of idols with taking a bath and changing your clothes. We've seen this, not yet, but we will see it again. Where will we next see this again? Joshua? No. Oh. When the children of Israel are getting ready to hear from God at Mount Sinai, Moses tells them, take the earrings out of your ears and take your, wash your clothes and prepare yourselves for the third day. Same type of deal. Um, returning to Bethel and setting up this altar. This is where God told him specifically to go. He has now fulfilled this. Did he fulfill the vow that he made to God when he first went to Bethel? If indeed you are with me and bring me back to this land, then you will be my God and I'll set up a pillar here and I will give you one-tenth of everything that you've given me. Did he fulfill that vow? Good question. I would propose to you for just a moment that him, that that 10%, that tithe, that 10% that he was talking about could perhaps be represented by the, all of the junk that he just gave to Esau. Possibly. No, it wasn't junk to him. He gave it to Esau. But remember, when, when there's no temple and you can't bring your tithes to the temple, who do you bring it to? Someone who's needy. Was Esau needy? Probably not. But he had to make right what he had done before. So could that, yeah, he had. Is it possible that that could tie together somehow? Just a question for you. Um, Rachel passes away on the way to Ephrath. Uh, and then there is the birth of Benjamin, the son of the right hand. And then Jacob and Esau gather for their father's funeral. There is some type of reconciliation there. And that and I'll put this back up on the screen for you to maybe take a note or something after. Uh, and then here is our Torah portion. There is not a meeting next time, but take a look at Vayashev, which is some fascinating stuff. You're getting into the story of Joseph and the boys and all that stuff. This is most, most fascinating stuff. So I'm going to put this back up on the screen, and I'm going to say uh, pause right here. I think Angela has a couple of words that she wants to share with you regarding something. I don't know. Well, what the it... things you said, I mean, I kept writing down what you were saying because so much of this is, it's just so linked. Um, I'm going to have to do this for just a second. <laughs> what you just said, when they were at the mountain and he said, wash your clothes and prepare for the third day. Remember in Hosea, it says, on the second day, he will revive us. On the third yeah. day, he will raise us up. Mm -hmm. And we talked about that being from Messiah and that those days were a thousand years. Mm -hmm. The second day, he revives us. And on the third day, he raises us yeah. up. And that's the millennial kingdom. That's that 7,000th year. So he's been saying this for a while. Wash your clothes and get ready for the third day. Because remember, three is that thing where we transition into mm -hmm. something right. completely new. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't say that. <laughs> so that now that was just a, a little side note at the end. But this whole thing, if you, if you think that way about what's going on with Jacob, because this whole story hints to the bigger story of redemption and restoration. Um, I don't know if I'm <coughs> going to make any sense here. When we look at Jacob's behavior... Consider the bigger plan. I know we think Jacob went the wrong direction, but did he? Did he? Did he? Okay, let's, let's think about his behavior and the bigger plan, what happened with Messiah, and that the older will eventually bow down to the younger at the height of the kingdom, and that the older bowing down to the younger at the height of Israel's kingdom during David's time was just a shadow picture of the real event, which is going to happen at the height of the kingdom. So, um, when, when, when Alan was talking about Jacob, he said, quote, 
He is a perfect example of repentance. He was humble. This is when he's giving those things to, to his brother. He was humble. He made amends for wrong, taking responsibility for his sins. Okay, other than them being his sins, does that not sound like Messiah? Example of perfect example of repentance, humble, making amends for wrong, taking responsibility for sin. Okay, so then if, if we look at Jacob's life and we think Messiah, there's some things going on here. For example, paying seven years of work for each wife, two wives. Remember the kingdom was split? Northern, southern, you've got, he's got two to deal with here. Rehoboam. Okay, and then six for the sheep and the goats. That, that struck a bell. Seven for each wife and another six for the sheep and the goats. I really am convinced that, that when John says that Yeshua came to save the world, I'm starting to be convinced it is the whole world. Okay, I know that we want to send some people to hell, <laughs> but I would just ask you to back up a little bit with that and consider. <laughs> Jacob says in his prayer, I became two camps, which makes me think of that split kingdom. He has become two camps, Jew, Gentile, the Jews and the Christians. Okay, and so we have this playing out over thousands of years now. Um, the present crossed over his all of his his present all of his animals crossed over before him and in his present you said the word for that was blessing the blessing crosses over before him aren't we experiencing his blessings now mm -hmm. okay before his return yeah. before he comes back to take the land and gather his family we're experiencing his blessings now. It's almost like he's he put that out there ahead of at the ahead of time. So that those have passed over before him. Um, uh, now this thing where Esau goes ahead and Jacob stays behind. Hang on a second, because that's going off that side. <laughs> He doesn't go with Esau, and, and you said he didn't go to Mount Seir because he didn't belong in Mount Seir because that's where Esau was. He doesn't belong with us yet. We've got, we, restoration has to happen before we can be together. Okay, there's some things that have to be fixed about us. Mm -hmm. And I know the disciples were thinking when he was there, it's fixed now. We get the kingdom now. But it was a two-step process with a huge process in between, I think, in order to bring in more, because he wants more, that multitude. And I, I, I think that, that, that we might be doing the same thing that the disciples did when we say, well, he went the wrong direction. The disciples say, this wasn't supposed to happen. It's not like this. <laughs> okay, so um, he will return to the land, and then gather his family, okay? So when you look at the ages, and this is what I'll wrap it up with, Abraham was 175 when he died, Isaac was 180, and Jacob was 147. The difference between Abraham and Isaac's ages when they died was five, which is considered the number for grace or mercy, which you said repeatedly tonight, grace, grace, grace. Okay, the difference between Isaac's age and Jacob's age is 33. Supposedly the age of our Savior when he was crucified. This is also supposedly the 33rd time Noah's name appears in the Bible is at that covenant, the rainbow, the promise. And the, 33 the 33rd time Abraham's name appears in the Bible is when Isaac, the child of promise, is born. Now that, I just got off the internet, so you have to check that out. I wouldn't, I wouldn't stake my reputation <laughs> on that. But I think it speaks to the fulfillment. This whole thing about Jacob is a story about the fulfillment of a promise of restoration of the whole world. And that is my confusing feel. A couple of shekels. Yeah, that's okay.
night. Ladies and gentlemen, there you have it. What a good discussion this evening. I thank you for your patience. Many, many rich blessings to you. Let us pray.